It seems like every day now we get new information about the plot by Donald Trump and his allies to overturn the election. Take, for instance, newly released emails that are now in the hands of the House Select Committee investigating January 6th. They reveal that in December of 2020, John Eastman, the Trump lawyer who urged Mark, Mike Pence to reject Biden electors on January 6th, consulted with Pennsylvania Republicans about how to overturn the state's election results. In messages sent through his University of Colorado work email, Eastman advised State Representative Russ Diamond to void Pennsylvania's election results and to leave the choice of electors up to the state's Republican-controlled legislature. Eastman suggested that by citing concerns with Pennsylvania's absentee voting procedures, they could basically do some fancy math and discard thousands of ballots. Quote, having done that math, you would be left with a significant Trump lead that would bolster the argument for the legislature adopting a slate of Trump electors, perfectly within your authority to do anyway, but now bolstered by the untainted popular vote. He went on to write, quote, that would provide some cover. Russ Diamond told Rolling Stone this week that he eventually came to the conclusion that the legislature didn't have the authority to appoint a slate of Trump electors. But... We know from this new trove of emails that Diamond was, at least at one point, supportive of that plan. In January of 2021, he wrote, Dr. Eastman is responsible for opening my eyes to our ability to exercise our plenary authority to decertify electors without any evidence of retail voter fraud. That plot, like the many plots that aimed to overturn the 2020 election, they didn't work. But the existential problem is that the plotters are still around and they are running for office. Russ Diamond, he's running for lieutenant governor in Pennsylvania now. And the candidate leading the polls for the Republican nominee for governor? Well, that's state senator Doug Mastriano. He has pushed, pushed baseless theories about Pennsylvania's election being compromised and that it should be voided. And he was present at the Capitol during the January 6th insurrection. And the threat of big lie candidates has not been unique to only Pennsylvania. They're running for office all across the United States. This primary season, Trump has endorsed a slate of candidates, many of whom fully support his election conspiracies. So far, they are 56 to 1. Joining me now is Mary Trump. She's the founder of the Democracy Defense Fund, the host of the Mary Trump Show podcast. And yes, she's Donald Trump's niece. Uh, the least important, obviously, characteristic for you, Mary. Mary, it is not just these candidates who are cause for concern right now. It's also Republicans that are already in Congress. I want to quickly play a piece of sound from Congresswoman Elise Stefanik on Wednesday when she was asked if she was a, quote, ultra MAGA. Very Ms. Stefanik, you're being called ultra MAGA. I am ultra MAGA. I'm proud of you. Mary, this is someone in House Republican leadership and also someone who originally came to Congress running as a moderate, but then she found that she could, albeit dubiously, um, win popularity contests by embracing your uncle. If Trump Republicans have the success that they have had so far in 2022, does the post-midterms ultra-MAGA Republican Party look like today, but even worse? Oh, Katie, I don't think we can comprehend how much worse it's going to be. And obviously, if they get the majority in either the House or the Senate or uh, something I really don't even want to think about, both, uh, the extremism is going to increase and these candidates will be emboldened, as will leadership. And we know who that includes. President Biden, speaking of leadership, has been using that phrase MAGA a lot recently. Last week, he said that MAGA is the most extreme political organization in recent history. And on Wednesday, he called your uncle the great MAGA king. Mary, do you think it's an effective strategy for somebody like President Biden to even acknowledge that MAGA politicians are to be recognized almost as if they're a, another actual political party? I do. And, and the reason I do is because uh, the MAGA wing of the Republican Party is the entirety of the Republican Party. There's no, there's no uh, space between them anymore. And I think we uh, do ourselves a disservice if we give any credit at all to so-called moderate rep Republicans, because they don't exist anymore. And we have to stop pretending that they do. 
These are not people who can be negotiated with. They are not people we can take at their, their word. I mean, we see what just happened with this vote in the Senate to protect uh, women. <laughs> and, um, you know, the two so-called pro-choice Republicans, which are, who are often referred to as moderates, did not vote uh, to protect women in this country. You have entered this midterm fight, Mary, in a concrete and definitive way. Your Democracy Defense Fund recently endorsed Senator Raphael Warnock in Georgia and Senator Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. What is it about those two particular races that are so important to you? Well, Katie, we're, we're really at the beginning of this process. So, you know, these are just the first of many uh, endorsements to come. However, at the beginning, we want to focus mostly on incumbent, Democratic incumbents who are facing tough reelections. Um, unbelievably enough, uh, Senator Warnock is in a fairly close contest with a dangerous and completely unqualified candidate in Herschel Walker. And he, Warnock has proven himself to be a great senator. We need to hang on to him. And same thing with uh, Maggie Hassan. We, we cannot lose any Democratic incumbents because our goal is to add seats uh, to protect our majority and also, to be honest, to negate the power that Manchin and Cinema have accrued because they find themselves swing votes on so many occasions. Mary, are you taking kind of a purist view then when it comes to the support that your PAC is being able to lend to particular candidates? For example, would the thought ever cross your mind of being able to assist someone to primary, for example, right, if there was a mansion or a cinema that was up, um, would your PAC ever consider assisting in a primary against somebody who's claimed that they're actually a Democrat, but we've seen otherwise? Katie, that's a really good question. And I think the most important thing to say about the Democracy Defense Fund is that we are going to support, endorse, and fundraise for pro-democracy candidates. It does not it doesn't matter what party you're in. If you are a pro-democracy candidate who is running against a candidate who is willing to undermine our democracy, we will be there for that person. I do want to shift gears a little bit and ask you about some news this week that could have some pretty big implications for the midterms. Elon Musk announced that he would reverse Donald Trump's Twitter ban after his acquisition of Twitter closes. We don't know when that actual transaction closing date is going to happen, but in your opinion, what would your uncle's return to Twitter mean for Republicans and Democrats in the midterms? I personally think it actually would help the Democrats because of the insanity that comes out of Trump's mouth but, and via the Twitter waves. But what's your opinion on this? I tend to agree with you. Um, I, and it also, there's no reason to think that this deal will go through. Um, but also, I think Mu uh, Elon Musk has, has revealed his hand too soon. Uh, so he's not to be trusted. He doesn't understand what the First Amendment is. And he's giving us, uh, on the left, an opportunity to prepare ourselves. Uh, because if he gets does get Twitter, he will let Donald back in, despite Donald's protestations to the contrary. He will come back on Twitter, because his truth social is a total disaster. And instead of fleeing, as Democrats are wont to do, we will stand up to this onslaught that will follow Donald's restoration on Twitter. We will not cede any territory, and we will be ready to fight and expose, as you say, the insanity of these people. Amid the news that the Supreme Court may likely overturn Roe v. Wade at the end of June, um, it's coming up in just a few weeks, is your fund looking um, for races where abortion rights are really on the line, where maybe it's become like a one-issue vote kind of campaign? Is that something that you're going to be focusing on specifically? Well, certainly uh, this imminent decision has increased the stakes exponentially. Uh, so. I think at this point, pro-democracy candidates are, are, are candidates who believe that women are equal to any other citizen in the United States of America. So it, they're sort of the same issue, right? Um, the one issue we need to vote for in November is democracy, because we are facing a situation in which, if you're not voting for democracy and pro-democracy candidates, 
And that includes candidates who support Roe v. Wade and a woman's bodily autonomy and the rights of pregnant people, then you are voting for autocracy. And this is a very dangerous turning point in American history. So we need all hands on deck and everybody has to vote. Well, Mary, I know that you and others, including me, we're all in to be able to make sure democracy is on the ballot in November. Mary Trump, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Katie.